Welcome to the Future of Education podcast. Here's our host, the co-founder of Two Hour Learning, Mackenzie Price. Welcome to Future of Education. I'm your host, Mackenzie Price. Joining us today is Dr. Julie A. Van Dyke. She is the chief scientist at Cascade Reading. They use advanced technologies to improve reading comprehension and really unlock the potential of readers everywhere. And I will tell you, I think reading is the most important thing for one, to encourage early love of learning, and two, it becomes actually really critical to succeed in academics as well as in uh, the rest of the world. So I'm super excited to talk with Dr. Van Dyke. We're going to discuss how EdTech can help improve kids' reading comprehension. Here's my conversation with Dr. Julie A. Van Dyke, scientist at Cascade Reading. Dr. Van Dyke, thank you so much for joining me today. I'm really excited to have you. Thank you. Thank you. I'm happy to be here. So you are a pioneer in the field of reading and reading comprehension. And I'd love for you to just tell our audience a little bit about what your background is and why this is such an important topic. Oh, thank you very much. So I have been a uh, senior research scientist at Haskins Laboratories for about 23 years. Haskins Laboratories is where really the idea of phonemic awareness and phonological awareness was discovered. One of my uh, dear mentors, Don Shankweiler, did some of the the original research that really showed that phonics was the key, the the main way of connecting with print. And then uh, later, uh, once we had uh, MRI technology, Ken Pugh, who was the president of Haskins, did some of the leading research to really outline the the scientific, the, the brain basis of reading, word reading. And so I spent 23 years um, in that environment. And uh, really, the science of reading dialogue is something that now has uh, gotten a lot of attention. And I really feel like it sort of all started at Haskins. Talk to me about that, the science of reading dialogue. Tell me what you're saying there. So science of reading um, is a real movement, I mean, uh, among educators and teachers and scientists, um, but mostly teachers. There, There was this recognition that for many years, teachers were teaching reading in a way that was not based in evidence. There was not an understanding of how people, how the brain processes language. And unfortunately, a lot of teachers were not trained in uh, methods that were going to be successful. And so we ended up having kids who just simply couldn't read. And once we started to really connect what we're finding in the lab about how the brain processes language, that it's phonologically based, and that really it's, you know, if you have a phonics-based reading program for a child who, even a child who has dyslexia or other types of disabilities, that child, we can actually change their brain, the way their brain processes language so that it looks more like a student who doesn't have those types of disabilities. So we wanted to connect what we learn in the lab with what's done in the classroom or at home so that we know that all the time that we're spending teaching kids um, is really going to have the the best effect. And Unfortunately, I mean, there's major reading issues in our country, right? We're having severe problems with kids' literacy rates. Obviously, COVID was a big problem. There's been issues with catching up. In fact, it's getting worse and harder. But do you think there's also a big part of that is that classrooms are not using this phonic-based curriculum in order to learn to read? I think that that's part of it, for sure. Um, Lately, I'd say in the last 10 years, things are really changing. There are more school districts and more classrooms who are adopting the science of evidence-based practices, science of reading, phonics-based curricula. The truth is, is that, so we know every two years we do, uh, it might be four years, I'm sorry, I'm not sure. We do what's called the nation's report card, which is an assessment of reading ability. Mm -hmm. We as a country started doing that in 1992. And now the most recent results tell us that only a third of our fourth graders, of our eighth graders, and of our 12th graders are reading at a proficient level. And we are hearing a lot about that because of COVID, but the truth is, is that that is the same as it was in 1992. It's really been flat. So we have been learning a lot about reading instruction. And when I say reading instruction and phonics, I'm talking about word decoding. But I really think that the missing piece in all of this is that we haven't been focusing enough on the comprehension side of things. So ultimately, when we read, we're reading to comprehend. But we don't think about that so much because the first step is getting children to be able to decode words. You know, you have to look at a a book and be able to just figure out what the words are. But if you think cognitively and, and sort of in terms of what's happening there, 
you're translating the printed word into a word that you already know from your oral language mm -hmm. that you learned as you were, you know, even before you even knew what a book was, you're starting to learn language. And so we're trying to connect to that. But as students get older and as we, we give them more emphasis on reading, the language gets harder and we just don't have good tools to help students on that comprehension side. Yeah. So that's really where I think we really are going to move the needle. And I just don't think that the, the reason it stayed flat is that we just haven't focused enough on the comprehension side. Now, I want to I want to talk more about comprehension. I want to talk about how ed tech is is using that. And I have a lot of opinions about that. But what I'd like to do is start really just at the very ground up. And I would love to do like a little comparison. I get people who reach out to me all the time saying, hey, my three-year-old, right? I have a three-year-old or a four-year-old. What app should I be using for reading? And um, my answer, I'll, in fact, I'll tell you my answer, and then we can see if you agree or disagree. I believe at the preschool level, the most important thing we can be doing with our kids is reading to them and instilling a love of reading, right? And so I am a huge fan of app-based uh, learning. In fact, that's how our schools, we do all of our learning via apps. Um, but for young children, when we're doing this, it's like, hey, just get books in their hands as much as possible and read to them as much as possible. Now, I think AI is incredible for making reading even more interesting with young children, especially kids who are learning to read because you can create personalized stories, you know, that use them as the main character. You can do all kinds of great things that uh, make sure they cater their interests with with what their reading level is or whatever. But I'm curious for like a preschooler, what is the advice you give to a parent? Do you say, hey, let's start working on reading or do you just say, just read a lot to them? Well, I'm coming from the science of reading and evidence-based practices. And, and so I just wanted to let you know that one of the major, and there's tons of research on this, one of the major predictors of reading ability is the number of books that are in the home. Yep. And whether or not kids get those books read to them. So you're right on the mark there. Wonderful. Another really language-based predictor is whether kids can recognize letters and know their sounds. So even without, even without the letters, if you can start to like, you know, articulate sounds so that they develop that letter sound knowledge, b, p, those kinds of things. I mean, it comes naturally. That's how, you know, those are the first things you hear when, you know, from, from, from a baby. So yeah. they're sort of already programmed for that. Um, but to connect those sounds to the letters on the page, that also is a huge predictor. And I'm talking about like, you know, before kindergarten. Absolutely. Great. Okay. So yeah. So in that little lightning round, sounds like we're on the same page, which is, you know, read, 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 get kids excited about the idea of reading and learning to read by reading to them, um, help them to identify their, their letters and the sounds that go with that. And um, I know at our schools, our kindergartners come in at such a wide variety. We have some kids who are already reading. We have kids who haven't even seen the alphabet, right? And it's sort of in between that. Now let's step into that early reader category, that kindergarten, first, second grade. Tell me what your advice to parents is there, um, especially when this is the point when our kids are heading to school full time and we're kind of putting that reading task on the school's plate, you know, like let's learn to read. What do you think uh, parents should be thinking about for those young readers? Yeah. So, you know, like I mentioned at the beginning of our, our discussion, there are a lot of uh, evidence-based practices now. The most important thing is a phonics-based program that's going to go through vowel sounds and consonant sounds and um, really help kids to identify those sounds and put them together. Mm -hmm. There are a lot of free resources now for parents and teachers also. The Reading League is a nonprofit organization of educators and scientists who are put together um, a guide for reading programs. So your, your listeners can, uh, can download that for free. That gives a lot of good, good advice about how to pick a good program. There are lots of programs out there. Um, so long as it's phonics-based, you know, that's, that's the way to go. Yeah. Okay. And that's a great question that, you know, people should ask their schools. Like, are you doing a phonics-based reading program? How is that going? Well, I've talked about this before on the podcast, but, you know, if a kid's not reading by third grade at, you know, grade level, it's a huge indicator of future challenges that they're going to have because starting in third grade, you're now starting to read to absorb information. You're not reading just to practice reading. It's, it's really how we learn. So we know it's a critical time is that kindergarten, first and second grade, we got to make sure our kids are off to a strong start on reading. And um, I think ed tech, I know in my experience, we're having incredible results from app-based reading programs. Curious what you think about that. Are you seeing the same thing? 
Absolutely. Yeah, there's a number of programs. So uh, there's a program that a colleague of mine at Haskins um, developed called GraphoGame, which is actually been u- being used internationally to teach decoding skills. There are a number of programs. There's also a number of diagnostic programs. There's a program that's being developed in uh, Boston at MGH. Nadine Gab, G-A-A-B, is the scientist who's developing that. That's a, that's a program for uh, diagnosing early reading issues. The topic of identifying kids who need help as early as possible is really important. And if you're in a public school setting, I would encourage, you know, if, if the kids are, you know, seem to be having difficulties, I would really encourage parents to go and get them evaluated. That is your right to get your child evaluated for free. These public school uh, board of ed has people who are trained to do that, and they can tell you right away whether or not your child needs some additional help. What age is that? Like, at what point should a parent say, okay, it's time to get my kid tested? Is that happening in kindergarten, first grade, later? Well, it's really, uh, I I guess different states do things differently. Um, So I can speak from New York and New Jersey. Um, So I, I actually also have a daughter who has dyslexia and math disability and spoken language disability and ADHD and autism. So I've definitely, you know, made it through this whole diagnostic struggle as a parent. So I know how difficult that is. The one thing I want to say is, um, first of all, just to encourage parents to be fearless and, to, you know, and to really fight for your child. Um, so that's that's really an important thing. In a lot of states, the diagnoses can happen even before kindergarten. OK. Um, so there are even birth through 3H3. You can get early intervention services. Um, your pediatrician can help to identify that. It's really important to make sure that your baby is reaching milestones in terms of, you know, how much language they're producing. Um, that can be an early indicator. And so your pediatrician can help you with that. And hopefully, you know, you have, uh, you know, early, you know, kindergarten teachers or providers who can just sort of be a little bit tuned in to whether, you ca- whether your child is communicating, um, you know, in a natural way. That's not always the case. So the parents have to look out and just sort of look for red flags about whether or not they're interacting normally, whether or not they're participating in free play, imaginative, yeah, imaginative play, talking with their, with their dolls or, or stuffed animals or things like that, anything that uses language. Because really by age three, you really should be having quite a lot of, you know, spoken language. Coming out. Of course. Um, and that's the foundation of reading. Yeah. I have to tell you a, a funny anecdote. It's funny now looking back, but at the time, my first daughter, um, she didn't say basically any words. I mean, she barely spoke. She, you know, at, at one and a half, she would maybe string, like she said, orange, balloon, moon, that type of thing. And my mother-in-law, who's a wonderful, I really lucked out in the mother-in-law category, but she was kind of like, have you, you know, have you talked to the pediatrician? Have you, have you done these things, you know, yet? And I'm like, she's fine because my mom had always told us that my brother and I were both, you know, she's like, you, you were both late speakers. And then about age two, you just started speaking in complete sentences. So I wasn't real concerned about it. You know, I didn't have any, any notice. And sure enough, at right about two, my daughter started, you know, really speaking well. But then my second daughter came along. And, you know, by six months old, she's saying ball and dog and this and nine months old, she's like saying sentences. And I thought, oh, my goodness, if this had been the other way around, I would have been so freaking out. You know, and it's really interesting, the difference just between those two children. You know, my second daughter's language was, you know, just light years ahead of where my first daughter's had been, you know, at a year, a year and a half old. But it's so, so critical is this early intervention and what you're saying on that. I was just going to say, I I just want to, again, you know, one mom to other parents that are maybe listening, and I'm a reading scientist. And, you know, you'd think that I would have all the answers. So my daughter is now 16, and she's reading at a fourth grade level. And I'm so proud of her, because it was a struggle to get to that. And I just want to tell parents, you know, it there is no stigma. There is no reason not to get early uh, evaluations. It's free, it will help your child and keep in mind, the statistics are that one or two kids in every 10 is going to have dyslexia. Mm-hmm. Yes. That's a lot. And many of them are not diagnosed. And if they don't have dyslexia, the same very statistic is that one or two kids could have what's called developmental language delay, which is a language. It's not the reading part. It's the language part. So you know, in a, in a classroom of 10 kids, you have, you know, four out of 10 kids could have serious clinical language problems. 
And that's just the way their brains are. You know, it's nothing that you did wrong. You didn't feed the wrong food. You didn't, you know, nurse or not nurse or whatever. It's just the statistics of how we're created. So we need to look for help early. Yeah, absolutely. And one of the things you mentioned about ed tech is it does do a great job of assessment and helping with diagnosing what's going on. It's also incredibly important because of the fact that often it's adaptive, right? That you can absolutely match the pace. And that's where I think ed tech has become this incredibly powerful instrument that frankly isn't used enough. How would you compare ed tech tools for helping with reading comprehension and getting better at reading compared to a, a teacher? Well, compared to a teacher, I don't know. I mean, <laughs> if I just speak about ed tech to them, you know, on their own right now, I just want to say that, you know, technology is, can be the great equalizer mm -hmm. um, because if you could have the best trained teacher in the world who knows exactly what to do, but she's trying to deal with 20, 25, 30 kids in the classroom, right? You know, it's just physically not possible to give every child the, t the attention that they need. So if you have a technology that can really provide a, a specialized support that is really completely, you know, that's really invaluable. I built a system called Cascade Reading, which was designed to fill the gap. As I said, I don't think there's really been adequate attention to comprehension level issues. We sort of, and when I say we, I mean clinicians and scientists and educators we kind of have for many years believed that once you teach a kid how to read words, decoding, then read, that's it. That's it. They're just going to read. It's going to take off and they're going to be experts. Right. And we see that that's really not the case. So we built the system Cascade Reading, which uses uh, natural language processing and AI to uncover the syntactic relationships within the sentence. What I mean, what syntax means is it's grammar. It's who did what to who types of relationships that a skilled reader, their brain can do that automatically. But a child who's struggling with syntactic um, analysis just isn't able to do that. And so our technology is doing that for them. And we present it on a screen with visual cues. So it's very clear what the subject is, what the direct object is, what the predicate is. And we believe that that sort of um, supports them in their comprehension, especially when texts get harder, mm -hmm. because it just makes it much easier to figure out who did what to whom, what's necessary information, what's not necessary information. So that is really an example of how technology can be tailored to the individual needs of the reader and can really level the playing field. Yeah, we've seen that in our schools. We use technology, you know, for the vast 95% of teaching our, our kids to read. And we do a lot of stuff for them around reading comprehension. Then what we do is we use our, our guides to spend some one-on-one -on -one time with the kids. They pull kids out one-on-one -on -one to really spend that time. And we found that model uh, of flipping, you know, majority of the time is spent with this one-to-one -one personalized adaptive learning platform. And then they get some some coaching uh, on reading too. And it's a huge thing to look at. What are your favorite, we're going to kind of wrap up on this, but what are your favorite ed tech reading apps right now? Cascade Reading is maybe one of them. What else do you like? You know, and the nice thing about Cascade Reading is that we also have a Chrome plugin, a browser plugin. Mm -hmm. So if your child is interested in baseball or animals or whatever it is they like reading, they can read that on a Chrome browser in Cascade. And it will be more easy for them to to comprehend just because of what the what the formatting is doing for them. So I really think that that is key. You know, technology and apps are not always the answer. I think I really love what you were saying at the beginning about just sitting and reading with your child, because what that you know, you're sitting with your child, you're you know, you're cuddling with your child, you're hugging your child. And, you know, as they get older, they might not want that attention, but they need to have something that is motivating to read for reading. And so, you know, if we can give them the materials that they love reading anyway, that they're interested in, in a format that they can digest more easily, then that's what we're going to end up, you know, that's what's going to succeed. And that right there, I think you and I are on the same page. I, you know, the whole motto we have is, is learn to love reading by reading what you love. And we are just super encouragers of reading. I think EdTech does a great job of that. I also believe that a parent at home reading with their kid is absolutely crucial and and really a special time. And I will tell you, I've got teenagers now and we bond over books that we're each reading. Like together, we'll read the same book. And that's a lot of fun too. So there's 
there's no question. I think everyone understands it's a it's a critical part. It's also a major issue, you know, in our country right now in terms of proficiency, and we got to get on top of it. But check out some of these ed tech tools. Well, Dr. Van Dyke, I really appreciate this conversation. We're going to continue talking more, but for now, this is going to wrap up this episode of Future of Education. Thanks again to Dr. Van Dyke. She's at Cascade Reading. Go check them out. They've got a lot of great resources for um, helping our readers. Oh, sorry, what? Lessons? There's lessons that teachers or parents could use. And uh, coming up in the next week, we're going to have cascaded texts that parents and teachers can download that are already cascaded with comprehension questions. So we'll go check out cascadereading.com for more information. You can also always go check out futureofeducationpod.com. You can get more information on our episodes, contact information for our guests, and reach out to me on social media. My Instagram handle is at future of underscore education, or you can search for future of education on YouTube. And if you haven't subscribed yet, we're going to publish podcast episodes regularly. So go ahead and hit that subscribe button. That's all for today. Until next time, remember kids are limitless. Our job is to help unlock their potential. 